if the the beer or the fluid is going through a, a tube and one continuous and it's happy flow, it's at that happy. resistance at that diameter at that pressure why change it you're exactly. gonna make it mad that's right don't want mad beer. No. We want happy beer. Happy beer. We want it to freely go into that can. Happy, uh, <laughs> happy little beer. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Just drop into the can, fill the can. Everybody's good. Don't need you exploding. You're and... the Bob Ross of canning lines. <laughs> well, yeah. Hey, guys. Welcome back to the Hot Break Craft Beer Cast, episode 16. Uh, we have a special guest today. Before we get into that, let's go with the brew crew. Uh, as always, joining me is Christy. Hello. <laughs> and of course, JB from Vexet. What's up, guys? And our special guest today is going to be Anthony from Cano Canner. Uh, yeah, yeah. Andrew. Andrew. I'm sorry. <laughs> we should. That's probably, quite all right. I don't know if we should do that again. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I Anthony, just, I apologize. I think we just cleared it up. Well, Andrew. I, Andrew. Andrew. Oh my God! I shouldn't have had that warm-up beer. <laughs> oh, the whiskey you brought was or quite the tasty shot of the too. Whiskey, yeah, right? that's right. yeah. Yeah. Um, no, we appreciate you being here. So uh, before we get here. started, we'll go ahead and roll the intro. Completely unscripted, delightfully unfiltered, and 100% fun. Sit back, relax, and get ready to have a great time as they bring you the latest in beer news, Ben M. Brewing updates, and general shenanigans. And now, your hosts, the famed brew crew. All right, so as I mentioned, we've got... Um, I'm going to mess up again. Man, my brain is all over the place. Andrew. 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 So I conveniently had it sewed on my shirt. You did, it. but your mic's blocking it. Oh, man. I can see it. Fine. I know, because I keep thinking your name is Honeydew. <laughs> <laughs> That's my nickname. <laughs> I believe that. So, yeah, let's talk about what we're drinking, JB. That's a good idea. So, uh, Christy, you've got some, looks like some Tower Station. Yes, Mother I Road. Do. I'm going to definitely do the other local beers, but I was already on a kick. I've already had a beer this morning, so, like, I was going to stay with this. It's yeah. one of my favorite IPAs. It's a great go-to beer. Yeah. got to have your warm-up. Uh, JB, you're doing some kombucha today, and this was I something that we had made uh, a couple weeks ago or so on our channel. There's some on our, on our videos. It actually came out really, really nice. It was super easy to do, so uh, we're happy with that. And then I'm doing a little Simple Machine Hoppy Boy, which is good. Um, nine percenter. Yeah, it's a, it's a big one. I think I can handle yeah, it. Yeah, I, I love that beer. Yeah. It's just not, i got to be careful. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's 1130 right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't drink all day unless you start in the morning. Well, that's true. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> I've got a Diamondback IPA here from, from you guys Lake, Pleasant. Lake Pleasant. Yeah. yeah. It's delicious. Yeah. It's, uh, it's definitely true to the style I like. Yes. Uh, yeah, no, that's yeah. definitely a good one. I'm going to yep. give this a sip here. And it's got all the right hops in it. Yeah, you had mentioned your inversion to the, the citra and the mosaic, so I was trying to make sure we got something that was a little more <laughs> up your alley. But maybe that was a little bit strong. No, but not yeah, at all. Yeah, I have strong mm -hmm. feelings about, you know. Uh, There's nothing wrong with that. There's beer styles that I really don't go for. I don't, I'm don't. i not a big fan of, like, the, the milkshake IPAs. I just, they make me sick. Well, and that's the beauty of the industry, right? There's something for everybody, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. sure. Um, but, yeah, in my mind, a West Coast should be a West Coast, and a Hazy should be a Hazy. Mm -hmm. They should not be mixing no. you know, together. Never the twain shall meet. Right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, there's a place for both in separate glasses. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, so let, let's talk about Cano Canner. Um, you know, we had uh, uh, Marshall on our podcast a, a couple weeks ago, and then Eric uh, from A Taste of AC on as well, and uh, they couldn't say enough kind of about you and the invention, and so we were really excited to be able to have you on so we can talk a little bit about that. But before we, we talk about the canner itself, which mm -hmm. we got to see in action. Right. And right, we got some beautiful right. footage of that. JB was, was had his all his gear out there and was doing some really cool stuff in action, and it is mm -hmm. just... And I'm a mechanical nerd. Like, I love that kind of stuff. So yeah. to see that thing in action and... and putting the lids on the cans and the slate or the skate and the, like that was just really cool and the, the small footprint of it but mm -hmm. before I talk more about that um, let's talk about kind of the genesis of, of how you came up with Cano like what's your background what what prompted you to to create that mobile canning system what's what's the background it's a little bit of a uh, long story slash journey and I guess I can kind of paraphrase but I feel like it's all important to how I got to where I got to and okay so um, you know I spent time in Germany uh, you know uh, was an army brat or Air Force brat my mom's English etc right Europeans okay. are kind of known for their beer right yes and uh, I've always been into beer maybe at too early of an age <laughs> uh, but it was always you know in the early 80s and whatever European beer and that's what they did really well um, and I don't know, it kind of bugged me, you know, because yeah. I'm, I'm kind of a USA, USA kind of yes. guy, right? Yeah. Um, 
Well, uh, Vermont Pub and Brewery opened in Burlington, and I think it's 1986 is when Kevin Noonan opened it. Okay. Um, and that was one of the original craft breweries uh, in the country, um, certainly in the first in Vermont. Yeah. Um, and that's where we got kind of exposed uh, to craft beer. And this is, I'm not going to age myself, but it's pretty early age. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and then other, it was, you know, in Vermont, they're kind of leading the way to a degree at that yeah. point. Yeah. And, and certainly in, in, well, in the U in New England, whatever. I know there's plenty going on in California, but I'd lived in Vermont. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, so we kind of moved out to, I moved out to Arizona because I saw that thing called the sun yeah. in the sky <laughs> and went, oh my God. Uh, and we were at ASU. So I saw a lot of other things that appealed to me at mm -hmm. the time. In the sun as, as well. A, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um. Yeah, I moved out here, and um, there really wasn't much of a scene, right, in no, uh, not really. Arizona. Yeah. Uh, so, and this is early 90s, mid-90s. Um, so um, yet the scene in Vermont was continuing to grow, and my interest in it nationally, right, national brands. And we were talking earlier about the first IPA, yeah. although it wasn't one, but Sierra Nevada, the Pale Ale, mm -hmm. right, was kind of mind-blowing. It was. That was you know? that was groundbreaking at the time. Yeah, I mean, yeah. nowadays, like, like you were mentioning about Stone, like it's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of commonplace. Right, now. but, at but the it time, was ground, it was groundbreaking. It was amazing. Yeah, yes. it was, and that was super exciting uh, to me. And then we talked about like Dale's uh, Ale, Oscar Blues, and that mm -hmm. was the first craft beer in a can. Yeah, which is mind blowing. It's wild to think about, like, because now you know, of course, canning is a big part of <laughs> way more than glass now. Canning I mean, is that important. Really has taken people. over. Yeah, but yeah, it really has. Yeah, yeah, but at the time there was a big stigma about it. Like, mm -hmm. oh, I can't put beer in a can. You know, good beer in a can that can't be. What would, what do you think caused the stigma? Do you think it was justified? Like the technology wasn't there. Well, there was, um, you know, uh, people think, oh, the can liner gives it the aluminum gives it an off flavor. Yeah. The this and the that. Yeah. And so yeah, you know, because it had always been done in bottles. Right. It should therefore always be done in right. bottles. Right. We've always done it this way. Right. Why exactly. Stop? And I think and, there, I, for me at least, back in the day, I think if you think about the beer brands that were associated with canned beers, they were not the craft variety. Like sure. So it was like the no the big brands yeah the, it was the big boys big that were beer, just like, in can yeah yes. it was like ab and bev like, like anything that was being, you know what i mean so well and that's um due in part because the equipment was so expensive which is kind of the story of you know why i'm here today i think is kind of you know mm -hmm. certainly a big part of it was the equipment wasn't available for smaller breweries mm -hmm. to afford um yeah. was you know the gist of it. it was incredibly complicated and uh, you know, the stuff that an Anheuser Busch runs is crazy, amazing, you know, well, the, stuff. The precision, the quality control, the, the size, uh, the size, the scope. Yes. You know, there's just no way a smaller operation could even approach. Yeah. You know, I mean, you need a whole separate facility just to house that side. Right. Of it. Um, you know, and then another facility just to house all the packaging material. You know, you don't even think about that. The cans and the case trays and just all the that. That's got to go somewhere. Unused. Yeah. 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 So, um Anyway, um, this, the industry started to evolve, right? And I could see where it was getting better and better and better. Um, and the other part that appealed to me was, so now we're making beer that's, in fact, better than European beer, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay. And why would I go buy a Newcastle, which I liked at the time, when I could get something from California, right, fresher, yes. that was perhaps, you know, two weeks old yeah why am i going to get something that i have no idea how old it is but you know i've got an idea I mean, well some it's idea. been it's been shipped and it's handled come a and long jostled way and yeah yeah and then a lot of that stuff was packaged over here so it's being sent over in totes but it's like packaged in new jersey oh, i didn't realize that yeah so they would ship it over in yeah a if tanker you look at it yeah and bottle it in the u.s yeah like heineken yeah. yeah i think it's heineken but it's certainly some of those if you look at them it'll say where it was bottled in the really yeah no, I didn't know that. Yeah, so you're just getting the raw liquid kind of sent yeah. over. Yeah. Um, so uh, there was that, and then there was the aspect of uh, supporting American jobs, local jobs. Yes. There is no way that craft beer could be outsourced, right? I mean, it's sort of a con complete contradiction. It is purely a local endeavor. Yes. Um, and of course, that's a a big part of you know my beliefs or whatever. You know, I want to support. American industry, and certainly in a time when jobs are all going overseas. Yes. Right? There's no denying 
uh, what craft beer certainly has done to support American Absolutely. labor. When more and more stuff is being shipped out and we don't produce as much stuff as we used to, we don't create as much stuff as we right. used to, craft beer is one of those things that, no, 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 no. Right. That's made in the That's USA. That's right. And there was a time where made in America used to mean something. Yeah. Well, that time is certainly now in craft beer and has been for a, a while now, yes. right? I mean, we've been kind of leading the way. Mm-hmm. It's um, local jobs and, and economy and so on. So... That appealed to me even more. Um, and then I got into kind of home brewing. Um, okay. Right? Yeah. yeah. So um, anyway, this all sort of comes to a point where um, Helton Brewing was being built out uh, down there on Indian School. Yes. 22nd Street. Um, I would drive by there every day uh, going to my daughter's high school or just coming home from work. But uh, I saw the brewery sign and went, huh. And uh, one day I stopped by. I saw you know a guy on the phone. looked like he was maybe important. I don't know. And I <laughs> said, "Hey, excuse me," you know. And it happened to be Brian. And um, you know, I said, uh, I kind of introduced myself and asked him, you know, what what was going on and when they were going to open. And he explained that they were doing the build out uh, mostly themselves, so it was taking a little bit of time. Yeah. Or whatever. And I said, "Well, I'm pretty handy. You know, I got a welder and I can do some things. So if I could ever help out." You know, please let me know. Let me know. And, you know, the only thing I ask is that you let me be a groupie, you know, kind of a, yeah. a brewery nerd, whatever, yeah. like that I can hang out here and it'd be cool. Get some behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. Oh, and I can like ask right questions yes. and I can see what works and what doesn't. Yeah. So if you're cool with that, I mean, let me be a brewery groupie, you know, <laughs> then I'm cool. I'm more than excited to do whatever yeah. and kind of see how a professional operation goes. Yeah. Right. So, um, that's kind of what really kicked it off. Um, Brian's like, hey, we need a, uh, a step made uh, to, to get past the inspection, the safety inspection to open the brewery. Like, it was a little metal step for their incline up. It had to have a certain dimension. Okay. But it wasn't something you could go buy at Granger or McMaster Car because oh, it was yeah. specific to their, their, uh, building, their situation. Their, yeah. He's like, and I'm like, a step? He's like, yeah, can you make us a step? I'm like, well, I don't know. I mean, I I guess, you know, so anyway, that turned into a way overly engineered thing. But yes, I made them a step and that got their doors open. You know, one of the things, uh, as it was explained to me anyway. Um, And so that turned into, well, hell, can you make us a a glass rack to hang glasses over the bar? You know, we're pricing these things out and they're like a couple thousand dollars. You know, could you maybe make one? So was your, your primary background prior to this? I mean, it's obviously you were doing some home brewing, so you obviously had some passion for the for the craft beer industry. I mean, you done a lot of welding. Like, what was your, your prior, if you can talk about it, what was your prior industry? Well, prior and, and current, I'm a master mechanic at Volkswagen. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. So I've been with European Dude, my friend, vehicles. you buried the lead. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. Did that so, start in Germany? No, no, it didn't. But, well, I mean, it did in a way because I was exposed to European cars. Uh, my whole and my dad was into European cars. Yeah. Um, kind of weird. I have an older brother. Um, he was into the American cars. And my dad was into American cars as well. Yeah. So he went muscle car. I went sports car. Wow. You know, it's just sort of whatever. Dad did both. So it didn't matter to him. We had Cougars and MGs and, you know, whatever. Um, so anyway, yeah. Um, I was always, from an early age, taking things apart. Mechanically inclined. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and, you know, almost burning the house down because I <laughs> take things apart and rewire them back Jeez. together again and plug Dude, them in the outlet. Dude, we're a kindred spirit. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I wonder what this will do. Yeah, you know? exactly. If I put so, the wire across these two terminals, oh, it glows red. Oh, right, uh, exactly. Yeah. Look, that red's going up the wall. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, and, you know, Dad was a car guy, so we had a garage with tools and things to go play with. Yeah. So it it always sort of interested me. It was just, you know, the natural inclination. So, yeah, I have a a heavy mechanical background. Yes. um, And heavy in the diagnostics, right? Okay. And sort of, okay, why does this work? Why doesn't this work? Um, now, diagnostics from a mechanical standpoint? Yes. Or uh, less, less the computer chip, because that's how a lot of them are nowadays. Yeah, correct. Okay. So it, it's more like uh, a problem with a car. Yes. Specifically. Yeah, okay. okay. So, um, you know, it's sort of a repair logic is what they call it. Okay, when does this occur? Why does this occur? Is there something else that's going on that this occurs? Because they could be one-off instances or whatever. Um, okay. 
so you figured out why did that occur oh well that's a poor design mm -hmm. right um and it's sort of you see something once okay that's weird you see something twice uh well okay we're getting a little trendy you yes. see something three times we've got a problem yes right? volkswagen or whoever you know this is going to be probably on every vehicle yeah and understanding the difference of those right um and then okay if something happens once and it's not happening for you how can you recreate that situation what has to occur for that to happen right and that just sort of is kind of give you an idea like how a diagnostician's brain works mm -hmm. and how my brain works yes. like you're sort of looking outside of the boundaries um at things right so what steps are required to recreate it because if you can Correct. Chase You've down got to steps. be able to recreate it. If you can't, it, it, it's almost impossible to chase down. That's right. Yeah. And then furthermore, you got to be able to prove that you've repaired it. Yo, okay. So yeah. you have to understand how it fails in order to implement a repair to go test that repair to make sure you have But is the repair it. actually effective? Like, That's right. Does it fix the whole That's problem? Right. Or does it cause more right. unintended consequences? Correct. Yeah. Yes. What else could occur? Yes. Mm. So the world of automotive repair is full of these instances. Oh, yeah. And every year they'll come out with a new vehicle, and you'll think, you know, uh, last year's model was just fine. <laughs> like, what, why did you have to do whatever you just did, and now all of these things are, are breaking, breaking, right? Yeah. Which is actually good for me. Don't get me wrong. It's what I get paid to, to do. <laughs> <laughs> but you sit there and scratch your head like you could have just left it alone. Right. You know, you really, if it's really, not broken, don't fix it. Yeah. It's, mm. And so, I mean, if you consider I've got 30 years in the industry, you know, Every year there's another instance of that. And yeah. every year from here on there will be also, yeah. you know. Um, so anyway, that's sort of my engineering background. And so that so the combination of that, mechanically inclined, the troubleshooting, the design, the experience you've had paired with the homebrewing that you did. And, and let me let – me, can I dig into that a little bit? So how long have you been home? Do you still homebrew now or um, – I don't. Okay. Um, how long did you homebrew for? You know, probably – Oh, I don't know, three or four years. Okay. Um, you know, I kind of kind of went down that road, got into it. Tried it out. Dabbled yeah, I went and I was kegging, um, okay. you know, um, all instead grain of extract. Yeah, just trying to figure it. No, I wasn't, you know, the all grain. You were doing all grain. Okay. Yep. Kind yeah. of cut to the chase there. And then uh, playing with fermentation temperatures yeah. and sort of understanding like that role. That control. And, and yeah. Yep. You know, doing all that. And um, well, okay. So the funny thing is, right. In doing all that, uh, cleaning is everything, right? Mm. Sanitizing. It's like 80% of it. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of your costs is your chemicals, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I knew a guy that uh, does boiler repairs in the valley. Okay. okay? And he had chemicals made um, to clean out boilers, industrial stuff or whatever, right. glycol systems, things of this nature. Yes. Right? Um, that were a private label from a company out in Ohio. So. What I started was Copper State Chemicals and Supply. Really? Yes. Understanding that, hey, there's an opportunity here, right, in chemical sales, right? Every brewery burns through these oh, things. Yeah. Like if, if I'm burning through, I'm doing homebrew, right, and pan. Well, then clearly it's well, a, it's and on a, the commercial level, they go through way more chemical and more right. different types of chemical. Right. Like the homebrew, you got your alkali, and then you got your acid sanitizer, and that's kind of the two that you really mess with. Correct. They're doing an acid, an alkali, a basic, a rinse, it's passivation. I mean, they go through so much more. Correct. Yeah. So with that, I said, okay, well, and then I talked to this company, and they said, well, as it just turns out, we have a line that we're already making of caustics and acids and so on. Uh, for a brewery here in town um, that we can't tell you the name of, although I think it's Great Lakes Brewing. And it's <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, basically, you know, we'll license. Uh, it, and then I, what I did was in talking to Brian, um, he was a big five star advocate. Yes. Okay. Yeah. What I didn't realize at the time was he was the only five star advocate in the in the state. Everybody else was big on Burko. Really? Uh, yeah. You know, from five an stars industrial. Huge now. Well, but it certainly then, is on the homebrew then, side. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 And that's where on homebrew, everybody's sort of five star. Yeah. Right. And, and, and Brian, again, I mean, they make really good products. So um, anyway, um, we kind of looked at what he was using and sort of said, okay, well, let's whatever. And if I can get this for you at a, you know, at a good price, would you be interested? And he said, yeah. And um, that's what sort of kicked it all off. Oh. And the, the product was proven and we were coming in at a good price. Yeah. And, you know, everybody was, you know, super happy about it, but it was the side things, you know, hey, can you make a glass holder? Can you make a this? Can you make me a yeast brink? Like, 
well, I don't know. What's a yeast brink? Yeah. I'm like, well, you know, it's, I'm like, sure. Why not? Right. This is kind of fun. So, so that's really what transitioned you from the chemical into more of the chemicals is sort of what got me in the door. Yeah. Okay. The fun stuff was what really, you know, was fun. Yes. And I had no idea what this equipment was. I made something called the hop tub, which is a crazy dry hopping piece of kit. Okay. That, um, I still am not sure how I did it, (laughs) but it was, it was quite a, quite a thing. Um, but anyway, what that allowed it was for me to use my brain in a different way than fixing cars. Mm-hmm. I get to go play with my toys, mm-hmm. my welder, my saws, you know, my... You're making I, stuff, you're I get, designing stuff. I'm getting paid to make stuff, which means I can go buy more toys. Oh, there you go. Right? So that I can make more toys with that, get paid more, you know, etc. So that's sort of what started this whole thing of going down the road. One day we were looking at um, canning lines that help. He was about ready to transition, wanted to get into canning. And um, we brought him up on the computer, and Marshall was there. And uh, his Marshall was, that's how I met Marshall. Mm-hmm. He was working down there. And, and Rob, he's a great guy, Rob Code over at Tombstone, right? Um, so um, anyway, yeah, they brought him up, and we were looking at a line, and it was like $35,000 or something. It was yeah. an entry level line. You're literally holding cans under taps over a sink. It was like a, a stainless looking uh, restaurant type of sink yeah. where you had a stainless sink with a, a the tr- platform a work is exactly next to it. It was yeah. all, all in one kind of a table. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there was a seamer that you would put a hand place, a lid on that can and then bring it and set it on the seamer to seam the can and then seam the can. And this was $35,000. And I went, Holy crap. And of course, everything in this industry on a professional level makes me go, Holy crap. Mm-hmm. How much? Mm-hmm. You know, like, wait, what? Yeah. Um, so, and like I said, if it's shiny, it costs money, and they're not lying, right? I mean, it's. <laughs> There's a lot of sticker shock in the brewing industry. Man. Like, it's just, but it's beautiful. It's good, but just that sticker shock is. Oh. And it's a really kind of a niche industry in that sense. You don't have a lot of options. Yeah. You pay the man. Yeah. You know, but I felt like there was a lot of gouging going on at that point, Probably. too. Like, there's a lot of advantage being taken. You know, not a lot of competition. Like, because I'm looking at this wanted. as an outsider, yeah. going, that's crazy. Yeah, right. you know, are you kidding me? Your like, material cost is not nearly that with the labor and stuff. Like, right. there's some incredible markup. So I both arrogantly and ignorantly said, "I can do that." <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, well, I can do that. So that's what sort of started it. But I also saw at that moment, wait a second, this is something people need. Yeah. You know, small breweries. And again, this is going back probably, gosh, I don't know. So I started in 2016 with the chemical sales, right, mm-hmm. with Copper State. And then that was the other thing. I quickly realized that going to talking to breweries, like nobody wants to talk about chemicals, right? It's kind of like, hey, what are you using to clean your toilets? You know, i got a great product. <laughs> I, nobody cares about that. Yeah. And you start talking about like yeast brinks or uh, eight-headed keg fillers and things of that nature. Then they perk up. Yeah. Yeah. Now that's an icebreaker. People, you know. And I, and I get it, you know? And it was almost, it got to the point where I was like, I don't want to talk about chemicals, you know? I want to talk about making the, stuff. Well, the fun stuff. Yeah, Solve exactly. Solve some problems, fill a need. Exactly. Yeah. So um, you had Instagram kind of coming out at the time. Okay. Um, I'm watching, you know, these local breweries, uh, maybe Brent House as an example, mm-hmm. right? They, they'll do a canning run. And now they've got content they're promoting on Instagram. Hey, we're doing a cam release tomorrow. You know, and then they're, you know, oh, man, it was a fantastic release. You know, we sold out in four hours or whatever the case may be. Yeah. But it's given them content, and I'm aware of it. I'm, I'm looking at it, you know, whatever. And I'm like, wow, that's really neat, you know. But there was not a canning line that specifically say Ren House or another would be a Goldwater in the original mm-hmm. peak in, in uh, Old Town. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, those guys over there. You know, in the morning, they literally roll that garage up, or they used to anyway, the garage door open out to the parking lot, and they'd have to roll their equipment out of the way, their keg washer and everything else, just to get going, just yeah. to have the room to get going. Yeah. So I'm thinking of uh, breweries like this, of which there are many, mm-hmm. right, that just don't, small craft breweries that don't have a lot of space. Well, that's a premium on the square footage, and you're yes. paying for that. you got to minimize that and utilize it, make it as efficient as possible. Correct. So I could totally believe that they open the doors, they're rolling stuff out of the way so they can get their job done. Yeah. And if they did have more space, they'd probably have another tank in there. Because it's a moneymaker. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, you're not going to have, you don't have a lot of free space. Right. Now, I will say Marshall is simple. 
uh, Lake Pleasant, those guys are a little bit more spoiled. Uh, they're very, the amount of they room they space. have. Yeah, they got room. Yeah. Uh, front front porch is a good example of a brewery that yep. has very efficient space. Yep. yep. Yes. So um, anyway, so I saw an opportunity and I went, wow, okay. This is a good problem to solve. Yeah. It's a real problem. Yeah. And there's not an option. And at the time, there wasn't. There really was nobody other than that $35,000 kind of piece of crap. Um, <laughs> there was mobile canning. And mobile canning, yes, right, uh, do a tremendous you know job, and um, they come in. But you've got uh, your constraints with that. You're on their schedule, mm-hmm. and of course they have to have a schedule, right? I mean they're trying. They're going to, around brew to brew, right? They and can't just like, hey, what do you want to do today? Marshall talked about that a little bit because he did some mobile canning. Yeah, he stuff. sure did. And that's, I mean that's a whole industry in itself. Which JB had mentioned that like I didn't really that was a thing. Like, they can't invest in equipment. They don't have the space for it. And so they have somebody come in on the back of a truck yes. and can their beers. Yeah. So definitely a need that needed to be filled. Yeah. And they can do it on a, um, uh, a much higher level. So, that, I mean, they're, they've got, you know, a very expensive piece of equipment. Yes. Right. And they're coming in and knocking out however many, 80, 120 cases, whatever you need. They're really more of a regional-based yes. solution. Okay. If you can't, if you've grown to a regional, but you don't have the room that a regional would have on the production side, they can service that. Yes, they can come in and crank them out. Now you still have to, you know, give them a couple people labor wise because it, it involves many hands. Yes. You know, moving stuff in and out of the way. Yeah. Right? And it also involves money that you're giving up because, of course, you have to pay them. I well, mean, yeah. They, they do a tremendous service. And they've they got an a, investment in equipment. Yeah, and their they've time got and equipment and, and so on. Yeah. Um, but also they have that schedule. Now, where that could be a problem is, uh, okay, well, what if your, uh, you know, your glycol went down? You know, your schedule for today, but your glycol system went down last night or whatever, and the beer's a little bit warmer than it needs you to be a package. It. Right, we've got to change things. We'll see you next month. Exactly. <laughs> You're out of luck. And then you've got this exactly. beer that you can't, you can't, it just sits in the tank. It's in the tank. You can't move it. But and you've got fermenters you that are ready to roll. Ready to move on to the, net, to the bright tank. You that's cannot, right. you're mm-hmm. stuck. Yeah, it's a problem. Wow. So, and what if your schedule, you know, imagine that. What if Something it comes finish? up that wasn't, you know. It, it, for whatever reason, the, the fermentation is a little bit slow and it's not ready for, for right. bu- mm-hmm. canning on that day. And it's like, great. Or your kid's sick. We'll or, see you next month. You know, whatever the many variables that yeah. life throws at us occurs. Uh-huh. Right? You're tied to a fixed schedule right and like you said if it doesn't happen we'll see you next month yeah because again they've got stuff they have they got stuff lined up their schedule so, booked there was an option but in my mind it wasn't a great one there was still uh, a problem to be solved here yeah and um you know that was sort of it so we looked at cost size and quality right because that one we initially looked at was expensive yes for what it was well it was disjointed yeah i mean the, the size was unnecessarily too large yes and the quality was nowhere near what you're gonna expect for a a good fill yeah you're hand filling it literally holding the can under a tap right and then you're placing a lid on it and you're seaming it whereas we're measuring in time and volume the the fill rate where we're generating consistency there's quality control because you're you're kind of eliminating that human error exactly yeah yeah you're doing what a automated system can do for you right within a tenth of a second yeah Every time, yeah. over and over and over again, right? Lid gets placed on correctly, mm-hmm. and then over quickly gets seamed. Um, so, you know, can we can we do that? Yes. Right? Can we provide an affordable, small option that does high quality fills? That was sort of our okay, go. That's your task. So, um, well, yeah. I, think, I think with a lot of that mechanical stuff, because we looked at the can, like I said, and, and watched it in action, and it's. <clears throat> the design of it is kind of a keep it simple, stupid kind of a thing where the less, and we have a torch if you'd like one. <laughs> How is this cigar, by the way? I'm going to detour a little bit. It's not a bad cigar. No. It's not. It's actually really good. Yeah. Changing the battery. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm interested in the brand. Where sure. do you get your cigars at? So normally I, and I, I'm always about support local mm-hmm. as far as, uh, you know, homebrew supplies and things like that. But like we're on a shoestring budget. So most of the stuff I get is online. Uh, famous smoke. We buy a lot of our cigars okay. online, yeah. but there's a really good local shop that has <coughs> their own uh, uh, kind of their in-house brand, which is what that is, and that's what this one is. Um, it's just down the road. Uh, I can't think of the name. Chicago Joe's. It was called, and now it's. 
it's a veteran owned like a little cigar shop and they do really really good and they have really nice stuff mm -hmm. their prices are very good but it's uh i smoke way too many cigars yeah well it it, 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 it stacks up real quick so i i'm partial to, to what my father's mm. those are really and good i have but, one of those yeah yes. but at what they cost per but for stick. 12 bucks a stick that's yeah, a, right yeah so but i actually just kind of discovered a factory factory um, rejects no or another called factory factory gosh what is it Factory cigar, I think it's called factory. Okay. They're, they're sold in bulk in a, a bundle, mm -hmm. you know, not a box or whatever. Yeah. And they're about. Well, I just did their Churchills a couple nights, mm. and it was really good. I was like, oh my god! And I think it's it like twenty five bucks a bundle. Yeah, well, maybe forty bucks a bundle 40 bucks for a bundle. twenty. So it, it's under three dollars a cigar. That's really good. And it's actually really pretty. Bad. They're really good. Yeah. yeah. And so. like we talked about with the like the whiskey or the bourbon, like the, and I feel the same with about cigars. Like the price of it really impacts the flavor in my mind because if it's this is a fifteen dollars stick, I'm like. It was okay. Right. It was three bucks. This was absolutely amazing. Right. I think it's a little bit more subjective with, like, scotch or whiskey, though, because, like, I do feel like there is a point where you're paying a price, and it's almost like, okay, this is not a great... You know what I mean? Like, there's a... It's a bigger differential, for me, at least, because I'm not a cigar connoisseur, but I think... I don't know. Like, I don't mind paying a little bit more for a better bottle of mm -hmm. whiskey or bourbon or, like... We used to well, drink to be a lot a, of single malt scotch, and it's yes. like now it's not affordable, so now it's like bourbon, <laughs> you know. But well, then we're doing Japanese whiskey, which was really well priced for yeah. what it was. Now that's skyrocketed. Right. So yeah. it's yeah. sort of like yeah, as soon as you discover something, the prices are going up. Yeah. And yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But on the cigar side, like I say, we're in Costa Rica and um, looking for you know, and they they just kind of don't exist. Sort of weird. Um, but anyway, I sort of discovered that well. Okay, but you can get Cubans down there. So I was like, okay. Of course, you can't really bring them back. But uh, Well, so I went down that road a little bit, and apparently Cohiba, and I could be wrong here, was bought out by a Chinese firm. Really? Mm -hmm. Yep. And Cubans are not just sought after in the U.S., right, because they're exceptional. They're sought after worldwide. It's a global kind yes. of brand, mm -hmm. a Cuban cigar, certainly. Yes. Cohiba. Well, as such, they fix the price. So where they're like $60 a stick or somewhere around there, anywhere in the world, including Costa Rica, which is also kind of an expensive place. Yeah. So there's a fixed price. You've got uh, an, uh, kind of a corporate culture there now, which has made the quality suffer. And this is all things I was reading about, like kind of studying. So it's like, wait, now I'm paying more because somebody just arbitrarily decided mm -hmm. to fix Because the of the price. brand and it's fixed. And yeah. there's legitimate concerns about the quality of it. Yes. I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> like, I'll, I'm I'll not do Nicaragua. That. Yeah. You know, whatever. Well, and they have the Cuban seed that they brought over to Nicaragua or, right. you know, other areas that they grow. And again, the climate's a little bit different, but it's still the same seed. So, yeah. Eh, it's not exactly the same, but yeah. they're trying. I don't know. I think just watching the process of what it goes into rolling a rolling good cigar. A cigar. And the, it's not even, I mean, it's long term, right? Like, they're growing things for years. I just have a hard time believing the quality would be the same because it's it's not the same it's not the same no, <laughs> like the they're not taking the same the, amount of no. time to no. preserve these leaves or grow these leaves or cultivate them i don't know yeah but, yeah no agreed so uh, taking all those things that these big it's way overcharging for and being like this should all be a smaller fruit but they're closer together like less less human interaction in some of those steps because when you introduce the human element that's where mistakes happen right that's where inconsistency happens you lose the quality control which is wasted product which is expensive right right so um and like i said at that time i had met marshall mm -hmm. right? um and marshall as you mentioned had a background in canning yes right? so he was a godsend right i mean he's my canning wikipedia and, and is to this day okay? he is a technical wizard from brewing, canning, bottling, like he is dialed into the numbers. I don't mean to, to redirect, I'm sorry, but he was telling me his, the brewers that he's got working under him, he has them do the math manually on the brew days. Like, okay, let's. this is your extraction, this is your gravity, let's mm -hmm. correct it, how do we do it? He has them do it longhand. Mm -hmm. I so respect that. I couldn't do that. So yeah. he is a technical yeah. Wikipedia. You know, for as long as I've known Marshall, yeah, I've loved that guy. I mean, just, he and I click. He's uh -huh. a great guy. Uh -huh. Yeah, he's a super great guy for sure very generous with his time yes. and so on. Um, so anyway, I sort of had him and uh, to use, if you will. And I, okay, Cause guess what? I'd never built a canning line before, uh, nor had I really ever seen one like in operation before. I just felt like, Hey, maybe there's an opportunity here. Um, so I asked Marshall, what do we need? Yeah. 
you know, what, what's this thing look like? What, right. what do we got to have? And so we started to kind of boil it down. Um, and then it was sort of left to me, sort of like, okay, well, we need fill nozzles. All right, yes. let me figure this out. Yeah. As it turns out, that uh, took quite a while. That was sort of the, the real holdup was getting was the, the fill flow. nozzles. Yeah. So um, why, why is, I mean, that seems like a pretty, well, I guess if no other canning lines existed, that wouldn't be a common off-the-shelf part. Correct. And we did, yeah, we found some out of China that was a nozzle for filler machine, whatever. I don't know. I forget how they describe it, but I don't know. It probably could have filled lotion into bottles, too, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That this beer to say, is really smooth and moisturizing. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, needless to say, it did not. It didn't work? No, and yeah. uh, we were getting breakout. So yeah. beer is an incredibly volatile, you know, or any kind of carbonated liquid. Temperature, pressure. Yes. Oh, you know, all that. Yes. Yep. So... Um, that's sort of eventually where my brain had to shift to that and sort of this whole kind of hippy dippy. Okay, beer is a flowing medium. Okay, let's think of beer. <laughs> beer is in a river, a stream of happiness. Be the beer. Yes. Okay. No, 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 well, no, no, what no. happens when the beer hits a rock? Right? It you creates get turbulence. turbulence. Yeah. You get white caps. Nu- nucleation get, it's, sites. It's no longer happy. Yes. Right. So we got to like. Yeah. Make sure <laughs> you had to get the Zen of, of exactly. beer. Exactly. So that's sort of the the design was okay. Well, and then you're you're dealing with things like okay, well the diameter of the tubing, the diameter of the nozzle. Okay, well what if we make it larger at this point? What does that do to the flow yes. and the speed and the restriction and, of it? Yeah, exactly. Yes. So uh, the thought was, well, if we kept everything the same diameter, and I mean from start to finish, right? There's a variable you don't have to worry about. Yeah. If we introduce the beer into the nozzle where there is zero headspace for air pocket to possibly get trapped, you no longer have to worry about that being it an exploding, issue. exploding, really. Right. I mean, just all of a sudden erupting out. Yeah. But the, the real hardship, though, beyond that is you have to have access to a brewery that's got a tank of beer that's to, carbonated. To kind of test that. Yeah. 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 And if you don't have that in your shop, and my wife just wouldn't let me do it. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't let you have a 10-barrel no, fermenter? I said, this is really necessary. That just seems selfish. I don't know. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's kind of a thing that you hadn't really thought about either. Like, oh, wait, right. we kind of need some product here to test. To test. To see, you know. Did you fix the problems? We did fix the problems. But you know what I mean? Like, you have to be able to test it oh, to exactly. determine if... Precisely. I've got a fix that didn't create other issues. So yes, we fixed that problem, but created this one. Yeah, so that was sort of, I mean, that was the beginning of the whole process. Of, like, you got to be able to fill the can. Yeah. Right? So there's no point in looking at anything else until we figure out, because guess what? Lid dispenser? How do you make a lid dispenser? How do you make something that like takes a stack of lids, but can cut one out yeah. and send it down a chute? Because they're not Right, and paper they sit thin, in each other. Still, yeah. Right? So... There's a thing. Uh, and then the seamer, right? Mm-hmm. You know, well, there's another thing. Well, let's figure out if we can figure out how to get beer in the cans. Step without, one. Step one. Right. Because without that, who cares if I can seem it? <laughs> there's no beer in the can. There's no There's a huge headspace. There's no, 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 no carbonation. <laughs> this right. is a really yeah. light beer. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's absolutely correct. So, um, But the other stuff you could do in your shop. Right. You mm-hmm. could make a lid dispenser. You don't need a tank of beer to make a lid dispenser or a seamer. Right. So, on. so anyway, uh, back to Brian Helton. Uh, he had those tanks of beer, and he didn't live too far uh, from me. So he agreed and let me come in and test. Well, after watching good beer go down the drain, you know, for a while, he sort of said, wait a second. <laughs> Maybe we should, like, hold on here. Let's, let's revisit this. Right. Yeah. So uh, then I had them do uh, – I paid them to do – or I, I traded them some services, let's put it that way, uh, of second runnings. Just some crap. Can we put some crap in this tank and carbonate yeah. it? Yeah. You know? I don't care if it's, and I don't need good beer. If you've got I just a tank need... you're going to dump or it's not quite good enough to sell, don't dump it. Right. Let me test with it. Right. So, um, but, you know, it involved bringing the line down there and testing it and, and people's time, Marshall's time, you know, very time consuming. Yes. And um, we just weren't getting. Uh, the results that we needed you know like it just wasn't working yeah. let's put it that way it wasn't yeah. it wasn't right um so it was very very frustrating but in in all of this man it really made me and it's very cliche but failure is a huge part of success right yes mm-hmm. yeah if you don't know how to fail you're never, you're never gonna, gonna succeed be because you'll give up you'll stop That's right 
Yeah, you've got to accept that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Period. I mean, yeah. if you want to be successful, you're going to fail over and over and over and over and over and over, right? And who knows how many times? You better be able to suck it up, or you're not going to succeed. Right. Succeed. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it it got pretty. You know, it's pretty bummer. You bring all this stuff down there, and you think you got it, and anyway, we were able to rethink and to where I made like a small test stand with a little nozzle. I didn't have to bring the whole machine down there. It was super easy to transport. Not a lot and of waste because it was a tighter scale. Kind it was of? just one nozzle on a platform, uh, gotcha. a test platform. So not a dual. With a hand-operated chingus. And uh, <laughs> I could bring that down, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, you want to plug that in? Okay. And it's not threatening at all. Right. Like, that's that not thing? threatening. Oh, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Um, so that sped things up, and we were able to like just test the nozzle, nozzle alone, and go, okay. And then kind of try out these theories. And, um, of course, I'm making these nozzles at the time. So I had to buy a lathe, teach myself how to use the lathe. Well, you have you know. to have the tools. Well, exactly. So you might as well get the lathe. Right. So I'm fighting on many fronts at this point, right? <laughs> um, anyway, we figured it out. Yeah. Right? Finally figured out what the issue was. Um, and that was kind of the key to it and that was sort of the start of it can you talk about what the issue was or is that kind of like a, a well, secret or trade secret or copyrighted and or, or trademarked or it was well it was certainly the design on the nozzle uh-huh. and considering what was going on internally in the nozzle and so basically keeping it as smooth a transition make that nozzle more or less look like the inside diameter of a piece of tubing right, right. Very few angles, right. very few obstructions. Just not massive changes in right. diameter, or anything. It, no changes in diameter, or no changes at None. all. Yeah, none. So that's a trick. Uh-huh. Okay, how do we do that? Right. But and I'm not even sure if that was entirely it or not. But it just made sense mm-hmm. at the time. If the the beer or the fluid is going through a, a tube and one continuous and it's flow, happy. It's at that happy. resistance, at that diameter, at that pressure, why change it? You're exactly. going to make it mad. That's right. Don't want mad beer. No. We want happy beer. Happy beer. We want it to freely go into that can. <laughs> happy, happy little beer. Yes. Yes. Just <laughs> drop it in the can, fill the can. Everybody's good. Don't need you exploding. You're and... the Bob Ross of canning lines. <laughs> well, yeah. I, happy little cans. You have no idea <laughs> how much of a canning geek I have. Beca- I yeah. think about it every day. Nonstop. I'll wake up in the middle of the night thinking about Certain things, even to this day, there's oh. things that I'd like to tweak better. Yes. Um, I believe I have become an expert in this issue based on the amount of hours they say you need 10,000. Well, you I got my 10,000. Yeah. You got how, extra credit. How many, uh, like, trial and errors or is it, did you have? Probably two years. How many iterations right? do you think? Oh, well, two went years. Through? That was some serious persistence. Yes. How many iterations of the design do you think? Just in the, in the, the fill tube? Gosh, I don't Hundreds? know. Hundreds? No. Oh. No, uh, probably like fourteen, twenty, somewhere around wow. there. But you know, and every time you do that, you're basically starting from scratch. Like that didn't work. Correct. I have to remake the whole thing. Correct. And then you apply your repair logic back. You know, my yes. other job is diagnostics. Just, okay, yeah. Don't change three things at once because then you don't know what you did. I'm bad right. about that. Right. Yeah. Just do the one thing. Yeah. See what happens. Yeah. Okay. Well, you get impatient like everybody, right? And then you're like, okay, well, this is another commitment of Marshall's time, yeah. right? My yeah. time, the brewery's time. They're letting me come in and hook up, right? So make no mistake, there's no way I could ever have done any of this without, without the support of those. Oh my gosh, there's so many good people in this industry, and yes. they're they're you know they're a handful. You know, well, they're just the ones I'm mentioning. There are a number of good people that um, I've met. So, but yeah, it was years, uh, and it was very frustrating because. Uh, you know, I just felt like this opportunity was, you know, like at some point somebody else was going to figure this out and get you know, before me yeah. or whatever. Like this wasn't going to stay a secret forever. So are you on like 3.0 or 4.0? Like what condition model-wise are you at this point? Well, okay, once we got the initial design uh, down, which is the nozzles, the restrictor plates, the lid dispenser, and, yeah. and so on, um, there's really made like small like two iterations on those maybe okay but the initial really it's been in the frame design gotcha just the the aesthetics of it and right. how things function mm-hmm. the the heart and soul of it has not changed okay so because that's what makes it work that's it the, right the, the slate the skate works for the lid the fill works for this the purge works for that the seamer works for that correct like, that is rock solid 
Don't fix what's not broken. Correct. Oh, I burned, a, I burned enough on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're fine tweaking the software, the frame, like you said. To, yeah. So so what version is, is out there to, to JB's question? Like, is there a 3.0 or is it just little minor tweaks and updates? As well, you go, OK, or? so the frame iteration, there's probably like four different frames out there. Oh, yeah. They're all the same, more or less size and whatever. It's just different. You know, whether I'll use uh a brushed angle iron here or tubing or, or whatever, the hinge designs with, on the shelves. With the design that you did, is it always kind of the same idea where the, the wings on the side yes. fold down? So that's yes. always part of that design, Correct. but you've improved the latch or the hinge. or Correct. The, okay. So um, if you look at Marshall, it's simple. Or at he front, has version one. Version the, one, and it's OG. always going to be the different OG. than everybody else's. Yeah. And uh, front porch. Um Theirs has a bracket. It's sort of a uh, shelf bracket, yes. stainless. Yeah. And then it latches into place. Right. Well, and it's welded into place, and um, it's kind of a pain, you know, to get it all lined up and uh, to, to make. To, the, yes. Yeah. Once it's done, it's, it's great. It's super easy. Right. Well, I was looking <laughs> at those things going, well, gosh, you know, if those ever failed, right, and let me back up here. In my world of mechanics, I also raced um, off-road rally cars. That's oh, cool. cool. Yeah. And I built the car and, and so on. Okay. So there's a lot of on the fly repair with those in the middle of the woods. Yes. And it's Without when resources. it's not if something breaks, it's when. when something breaks. Yes. And when something breaks, what does that look like? Right. Okay. Now, now it's looking at it from my point of view as a mechanic, not the poorly engineered car that came from Germany. I'm not saying Volkswagen, Mercedes, you're really bad too. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's my job look like? to fix that and yeah. that is a huge thing for yes. me. as you can imagine of 30 years in that industry i get really upset with poorly designed things because yes. they did not consider what does it look like when it breaks you have to go and, and fix it outside the lab. Seen, uh, and things like, are gonna break i'm not a mechanic but i, I like watching wheeler dealer yeah where they go back and they're like oh this is porsche you have to like undo all of this to get to that one part correct so you probably thought about that when you were making yours correct so yes when i design something i start from the what does it look like when it breaks, right. and then we work backwards from that point, okay? That's always in my brain, okay? And that's how you make something kind of bomb-proof. Right. And the simpler you can... Now, to me, that is a well-engineered right. piece of equipment. Right. Do you need to be an engineer to operate the thing you've just bought? If so... It's a problem. It's yeah, complicated. It's not, it was not well-engineered, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. They, the engineers should be solving those problems for you, right? not adding to you, right? Right. So that's a big, and you see, it's incredible the stuff you see in the industry. Like, yeah, okay, that was not well thought. Mm -mm, you know, right. like there was no thought, if, right? Whatever. So uh, the hinges to me seem like, well, if they failed, that would be a problem. Yeah, because they're welded in, and you right. know, whatever, they're a mechanical thing. Um, as it turns out, none of them ever have. <laughs> right. But I started, you know, not panicking, but okay, I need to fix that. There needs to be a different approach so then we went with ones that are removable that are pinned yeah uh so they slide down into holder and then you pull and them up and them slide place. them in and you lock them into place yeah um so same idea but they weren't hinged they weren't permanent were. or yeah. hinged yeah. well that had its own set of uh hardships if sure. you will that i didn't like and and this is on the ma the manufacturing side of things not not the not the end user yeah it was just too uh quirky to put them together each one is very very custom okay so uh anyway then we currently went to like a, a stainless hinge with pins that latch and, and we're constantly looking at that just to see just fine-tuning and tweaking right. and, but yeah. the idea of the shelf on each side will never change yes right well because um, you want that to be the full then so it's they don't have to roll it outside of the brewery it goes in the corner right and so this got to be part of the problem solving thing you need a small piece of equipment okay cool but what are you going to do before you can a beer? Well, you need to clean those cans. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, as you dealt with bottles, right? But cans are pretty flimsy when they're empty or whatever. Mm -hmm. They're very, like, they're crazy. Yes. So what, you're going to hand soak each one of these things in a bucket of uh, sanitizer? Or you're going to spray sanitizer in each can? Like, that doesn't sound cool. But the big rigs have a deep howl with a twist rinse, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the problem with that is, one, it's expensive. Right. But, two, it takes up a tremendous amount of room. So now you're cutting into your space problem. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so is there something we can introduce on this canning line that will solve that? Well, yeah, the can, or the, the glass rinser. The glass rinser. Yes. That was genius. Which is a brilliant, because it's existing technology that has been around for Correct. a very long time. Just 
but you're passing sanitizer through it. Correct. Just and looking so at it a little spritz. differently. So you're not wasting a whole lot of sanitizer. You don't have to soak the whole thing. Mm-hmm. You just it's a quick spritz. Thirty seconds, you're sanitized. Right. Yeah. So, it's the knowledge of uh, having done craft beer and and. Uh, filling bottles and whatever, and appreciating that side of things. Mm-hmm. Okay, things have got to get cleaned. Yes, and whatever, and then we gotta fill them. Okay, and then guess what? You gotta do, get rid of them, right? As you're hand filling those bottles with your wand or whatever, they quickly kind of get in your way, right? Yes, right. and you gotta get them capped. And there's so much more going on than just filling just that filling. bottle. Yes, right. that's often mislooked, right? Yeah. So having the shelf on the other side, a place to put the things out of your way. You know, built in. That's Otherwise, you got a roadblock. It's a, yeah. it's a bottleneck. Yeah. Okay. You could seam it, but then you got to put the can somewhere like, yes. easily. So, we're going to walk over and set on a table each one. Well, that's not really a solution. Right. right. So, um, so yeah, that was the need for the other shelf. Well, okay. Well, so now it's an eight foot li- wide uh, product, but I need it to be small. Mm-hmm. Well, so those shelves have got to. They got to fold. They got to go away. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, you know, it's looking at these things from that point of view and then going, okay, well, how do we do it, you know? And then, you know, tying the uh, the rinser, well, that's got to be tied into a, a corny keg, something that holds a sanitizer. Right. Or, well, so we, that you can pressurize, no correct. pump. Right. Yeah. So we, you know, corny keg works perfect for that. Yeah. Right? It's easy to fill and so on. Uh, and then say, well, if we're going to do that, then we can run the CIP cleaner through it as well. Hell, we can clean the lines. You know, why not? We're yeah. just adding a different you know, uh, breweries or or whatever, the five-star. It's like, okay, well, that's got to get pressurized. Okay. Well, we've got CO2 coming to the line, Mm -hmm. right, because we're pre-purging the cans with CO2, so we have a source. Right. All right, well, just put a check valve in and tie in that, you know, and let's put a shelf down there, there. and we'll just put the the keg on the shelf, and now we've got a built-in cleaning system. Yeah. Right? All right. So then it was sort of, we had a compressor, and we had a huge compressor when we were first testing this mm-hmm. uh, to run the pneumatic actuator. And that was built into the bottom of the stand? Well, it wasn't to begin with, no. It was no. a separate, say, 24-gallon, you know. Tank compressor. Full-size compressor, if you will. Okay. Well, we realized in running, once we got the problem solved and we were running at Marshall's, uh, that thing never turned on, <laughs> like, ever, like, in the whole run. It's like, well, gee, I wonder so you how. you an entire run and never deplete the tank. Never. Oh. I'm like. Well, that's interesting. So that's I go, great. well, I wonder how small we can go. Yeah. So we started playing with different sizes, and it's like, well, heck, if we can go this small, we'll just mount it to the frame, and we'll just wire it into the control panel. So there's another problem solved, if you will. Right. Um, so because at Brian's, he ended up getting a larger canning line because he wanted to become a regional at Helton Brewing. That was their whole model, um, you know, as well. So he was, even though the idea came from him, uh, he was never my intended uh, client or customer because right. I knew what, what I was doing was for somebody else. It was for a different size brewery yes. that right. had no interest in being regional. But the fact that he still helped you out. Oh, for sure. No, oh, great what guy. A, what a great guy. Well, I mean, great even guy. talking to Marshall, like, I don't, I remember going to Helton and he, I think we talked about it in the last podcast with Marshall. He's kind of larger than life in a way, too. Like, he marketed himself very well and the brand very well. So I think he definitely had higher, like, in his mind, higher goals than like the market like mm-hmm. he seemed very driven and yes a great spokesperson yeah, so, yeah. no i love the, the the design and the mechanics and i love too when you said that like your brain kind of obsesses over little things like you wake up in the middle of the night and be like oh wait i should do and i should do the my brain's the same way it drives me nuts i can't sleep yeah but no, i'll, so, I'll be yeah. constantly thinking about how can i improve and tweak and go and maybe this will work and let's try this and i mean just well uh, and it's funny uh, because inevitably the next day it just comes to you there mm-hmm. it is. When you're not focused yeah. on it. Right. You're not trying. You right. You can't, like, solve it or whatever. Make yourself solve it. And, mm-hmm. you know, it just inevitably, it just sort of It comes. pops in your brain. You're like, well, that was much simpler than I was thinking. And it's crazy, too, because I'll be looking at something, uh, a design that I've had for a couple of years. Like, we changed the skate and mounted it on the lid dispenser now, okay? The skate is what holds the cap on. It mm-hmm. keeps it from floating off, essentially, is its role. It puts a little bit of pressure just to keep it cap So the in foam place. doesn't... Re- yeah, so it doesn't float Cascade off, and you're not off. introducing oxygen into the can of beer. Yes. And the first can is getting seamed immediately. Well, the second one's sitting there, right? Yeah. So the skate is putting pressure on that lid. Well, I used to have a separate bracket for that skate, okay? Uh, it was just separate. Well, the problem with that was if you wanted to do smaller size cans, okay, you had to 
There is now three things you, well, four. Okay, if you want to do smaller cans, you want to go from 16 to 12. Okay. Okay. Now, the nozzles are going to come down bottom's bottom. So you're changing the timing. That's the only the, the thing. The fill. Yes, the fill. Just a little shorter fill time. Correct. Okay. So that's an adjustment, but that's no big deal. Next thing is you've got to lower the lid dispenser. Okay. okay. Because the lid, you know, it's got to come Those down lower. That's pretty standard. That didn't, shouldn't be too difficult, right? No, no, but it's another adjustment Sure. you have to do. Yes. Okay. Now there was the skate bracket that had to be lowered, right? Yeah. Okay, whatever. So you have to lower that. But then on top of that, your seamer, right? And what happens in the industry is you have to, the arms that hold it, the upper plate and the lower plate, you have to swap those out and lower. Because um, you can't move the mechanics of it. You have to move the tool itself yes, to be longer. The upper chuck, or, the, yes. uh, the ops and the upper chuck yes. and the motor come down yes. to the puck that lifts the cam. Right. So, all right, well, now we're talking quite a bit of messing around, right? Okay, well, let's look at this. We can't really do anything about the nozzles, right? Or the nozzles are where they're going to be, and we just change the timing. That's not a big deal. Right. All right. Well, what if we made a longer stroke piston on the seamer, right? It's still going to apply the same amount of pressure at 90 PSI. Why couldn't Specify we? Specify where it stops. Yeah. But have a longer when seamer it stops, so you have more options to go lower for the shorter cam. Why do I have to change out these arms? I can just make a longer piston. Yes. And we stabilize it with a rod, an anti-rotation device. <laughs> Why can't we just do this? Okay. And the funny thing is, a lot of this is because I'm looking at it from outside of the industry point of view. Yeah. Right. Now, if you ask Marshall, as much as I love him, he's used to seeing things a certain way. Mm -hmm. Right. This mm -hmm. is how we do it. Yeah. You know, or, or as an, and that is a lot of people need. Well, that's just sort of how it's done. Right. And then, you, and my job is to look at it and go, well, that's dumb. Okay. Like I, that's dumb. that don't make any sense. Right. Like it's going to apply the same amount of pressure. Right. And that's the constraint. Right. Is the amount of pressure. So what if we did so on the new models? We're doing that. Okay, so then what do we get back to the lid dispenser and the skate? Well, then it occurred to me, well, the skate is always in the same position relative to the lid dispenser. Right. So if I do 12s, its relationship to where that lid goes on is the same right. as if I do 16s. Right. So integrate the skate into the damn lid dispenser. Yeah. It took me two years to go, well, that was stupid. Why don't you just make a new lid cover? And that's <laughs> what we did. So now, if you want to do 12s on my line, you do one adjustment. Yeah. Period. We just cut four you, down. You well, cut a step out, basically, a whole other piece of equipment yeah. in that. Yeah. And it's now combined into one. Yeah. And it drops to the same height yes. no matter what. But it's the whole mechanics yes. that so are moving. The skate moves with the dispenser. Yes. And it's that the position is always the same regardless. So, and now we have a seamer with a piston that can do 12s. Or you don't have to change out. Because, again, I want to make things simple. Right. I don't want you, like, you know, you most people aren't necessarily mechanically inclined and when you start opening cans of worms like that then some when problems occur yes and i don't really want these problems to occur right i want to make uh it's got to be simple right for the end user who's not an engineer right but the the trick is is to make it simple i mean that is actually really difficult to make something do everything at a really high level yes but to make it is i mean it's sort of like an ipod I'm not comparing myself to apple but if you think about it that's a kind of a genius you know, I agree, hundred <laughs> percent. She's our She's Mac Apple, and Apple yeah. 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 fan girl. Well, well, yeah, I, I'm not an Apple person per se. <laughs> me, in my ecosystem, it works perfect. Like you said, it's very simplified. I don't need to know how to, you know, add hard drives into my Mac or, you know, uh, build a new computer off of it. I right. just want. You don't need to be the engineer to Correct. figure out how it was well engineered to begin with, right. so that the lay person could use it and be happy. Right, and that's really what we're getting at here because guess what with equipment it's usually the equipment that get blamed for the failure yes not the end and how many yeah. people out there have ever run a canning line before it's not something you're taught in grade school not probably the, like the, nobody yeah, yeah, probably right. like <laughs> but absolutely. it should be you know they need to bring it back shop be. class it's and remedial canning, canning line. skills <laughs> <laughs> well i think this is something that we've touched on on our podcast multiple times so as because brian is very good at building uh, as we've come up with like building systems and welding and doing his own thing do you look down on brewers if they don't home brewers that don't build their systems up or? oh not at all okay. no 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 um no this industry sort of weird to me and i and i have an opinion and I, I could be wrong here but from my point of view and especially on the home brewing side right it's from all the way at the range and this is not meant to be disparaging but from a hippie who can brew five gallons in a bucket 
using a stick with some yeast on it because he can. Yeah. Right. To a IBM engineer that's got spreadsheets and temperatures and every, it runs the gamut. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of wild to me how they both can do it. Yeah. And they both more or less end up at the same spot, but the vastly different approaches. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that transitions into the professional world as well. You've got people that are more hands on, say like Brian, mm-hmm. right? Or guys that will just spend the money, like they're too busy solving other problems. They don't need to solve this problem. Right. 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 And it also occurred to me, like people like Brian, you know, in a way that they, they're, you know, or Marshall or a lot of the guys, they're, they're like farmers, if you will. I mean, they're, they got to figure it out. Right. You know, it's mm-hmm. their problem to solve. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, so no, I don't look one way or another. I certainly enjoy the guys that are problem solvers, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I get the other side of it as well. And if I make something that can get their approval, well, then I'm really doing something right. Well, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, but yeah, at, at Brian's is where when he was specking out their new line is where I was able to see some other things. Okay. You're getting a new canning line. Okay, cool. All right. Well, where's it going to go? Mm-hmm. Right, well, that's a problem. Okay. All right, cool. That's there. Well, you're not done. Right. So what kind of uh, compressor does it need? All right. How big a compressor? Whatever. All right. There's. Or where's that going to go? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, what kind of power does that require? Okay. Well, do we have three phase over there? Yeah. All right, call the electrician up. Get him down here. Okay. Where's the beer coming in at? How are we going to plumb it over here? Right. Okay. Well, that's. All right. Well, now where are the cans going? Where's the DPAL going? Where that's more space? Do we even consider? Um, you know, um, get the electrician back on the line again. So there's a lot of things that like. You know, we're kind of over. And then you get that piece of equipment there, and you're like, oh, my God. Like, we could go to the moon on this thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> and it's it's kind of funny because I don't know if I want to say there's this arrogance, but there's this confidence, right, that I've seen with, let's say, some breweries, mm-hmm. okay, that I don't understand, right? Because it's uh, – you may be an excellent brewer, okay, but that doesn't – qualify you to be able to run a piece of equipment I right. mean, one doesn't equal the other correct there's a lot of learning that has, that's a and on a high end that's a specific level you have guys employed to do the packaging only right, right? any more than a guy that's technically proficient enough to run a canning line can become a master brewer just because right yeah that uh, there's no, no there's no correlation but yet seemingly there is you right. know and you see it and i see it over and over and over again and you sort of want to I don't know. Uh, I, you're like, look, like when I look at this piece of equipment, I'm overwhelmed, mm-hmm. right? Some of these large canning lines. Yes. It's like, my God, there's a lot going on here. So for somebody that's like less you know, proficient at that sort of thing, there's any number of opportunities for something to fail. <laughs> uh, a mm-hmm. timing is gen- typically what it is. Something yeah. comes out of time. Right. And the whole thing goes sideways. Yes. Like real quick. Yeah. And now it's a phone call and it's a problem. And you've got beer in a tank that's not coming out of the tank and, and so on. So these were all problems that I'm like, man, we could solve all of these. Yeah. And so putting the rinse system in the, the canning line. Built in. Putting the cleaning system in the canning line. Putting the compressor in the, the canning line. Let it run off 210 instead of. Yeah, 110 one, instead of one three ten, phase. Me, yeah, right. Yeah. 40 foot long cable. Okay. Run it into a GFI. You wheel the machine to the bright tank. You Directly don't bring the bright it. to it or right. you know through a hose. right? Yeah. So you, it's. Very high efficiency. You're just purging two lines and you're running. So yeah. if you're doing barrel age and you're a small brewery, you want every drop. Yes. Okay. Well, that's what you're not having to purge a 20 foot long uh, a hose. Line. Yeah. yeah. So well, who doesn't have 110, right? You know, you probably got beer and you have CO2 if you have a brewery. Right. So, so that's a given. So there's no special run that has to be done. You don't have to call the electrician to. You've got power. Right. So and the the hardship is explaining to people the problems that you've solved that they're not aware of because they haven't gone through them yet. that. Yes. Right. And you're trying to tell them without being, you know, like arrogant or whatever, coming off wrong. Right. Like, look, we've solved a lot of problems here. That like, you don't even realize. Right. You have no you idea have no of the idea. problems. You know. You have no idea how much work I put in to solve your problems. Right. And <laughs> there's only one way that occurs, and that's working with working on it yourself yes. and working with people and standing going there. Those pain points. Yeah, canning beer. Yeah. And going, well, this is dumb. Yeah. Or this is great, or whatever. Uh, and getting feedback from the the great breweries around here, Lake Pleasant, Front Porch, Marshall. Absolutely. You know, man, Marshall trains every one of my my uh, customers. 
So he he mentioned that he was like the 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 certified trainer for the mm-hmm. for the Cano, mm-hmm. and he's very proud of well, of the machine. Be. And <laughs> he's number he's got the number he, one. He's got the OG. He's got the OG. Yeah, the number one. Uh, and yeah, he's very proud of it. And that was cool because little did I know COVID was coming. Mm. So this so, was even before. This was pre-COVID. Okay, that was perfect timing. Perfect timing. Well, honestly. it was. <laughs> I wish I was a year ahead of things, but I was still in a really good spot. Right. But. Um, yeah, COVID kind of changed everything for everybody, right? right? If you weren't packaging, you were in a bit of a bond. That was something that I think was, obviously COVID came out of left field, but when you're running a brewery and then suddenly you have a tap room have that's no been people. full and jamming and jiving, <laughs> and all of a sudden, like, nope, you're shut down. You have to convert to a packaging line in a week yes. or, or you know, as fast as possible. So here's the good part of the story is when we solved that fill problem, yeah. we'd already had the other things sort of established, the lids, you know, because they were things I was able to work on okay. separately. Mm-hmm. We brought it up to, to Simple. They had just opened two months prior. We plugged it into his tank, and we knew immediately we had solved it. I mean, it was one of those kind of a eureka moments. That's a moment. It was thing. like, oh, my God, uh, we did it. Right. So I needed Marshall to run it. I'm like, here. Just take this thing and abuse it. Do whatever you're going right, to do. Right, is the end that. user challenge this thing? Push it. And COVID hits. Enter <sighs> COVID, which was amazing for well, okay, it was awful. Yeah, of course <laughs> we get what you mean. Yeah. But you need but to find the opportunity. Marshall had in, just opened a business and Trevor up there. Yeah. That needed a canning line. Yeah. I needed a canning line tested. So Stress that testing. thing, yeah, it ran more in you know. I got so much data off of that thing. I got years of data in that thing, like in a month. Right. You know, and it was just. I mean, you're no longer having to run it off of the the toss tank, like the dump tank anymore. Like you're getting like, no, this thing is. We're getting legitimately. What a stress test and and good data and saying like, yes, some of this stuff that I come up with, it's solid. This works. This is coming together. Yep. And again, it's not about what something looks like when it's working. It's like what it looks like when it's not, not working, when yes. something happens. Yes. Those are the things you need to solve. And by just testing the living heck out of it, uh, you get to see it. So it was, in a weird way, a blessing for me. And, yeah. Uh, absolutely a blessing for, for them because, you know, they're, they were kind of hosed if you weren't packaging. Yeah. And well, so they really get. I mean, I think it really did kind of define a whole different part of the industry where now, after even COVID, I think more people are. There's an, there, there was that kind of initial, let's go out. We haven't been out in a while. But I think it also created a homebody culture where a lot of people are perfectly happy being at home. Let me grab a six or four pack. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like it kind of honed in on a whole new. There was like, there was like two industries that really boomed during COVID. This is going to sound awful when I say that, but there really were. <laughs> One was like, and the, the brewing was tough, but definitely people were, were drinking beer at home, especially if they could package it and take it home. And they were all remodeling. Like Home Depot did a booming business yeah. <laughs> when right. COVID hit because everyone was home drinking and remodeling their house and improving things. A lot of people were remodeling. Yeah, yes. I was painting my house. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. right. And Redoing buying, the backyard. A lot or of time yeah. buying your pelotons and right. Uh, oh. That's deep, deep clean and a, a sourdough yeast starter. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So, but again, that was sort of the, and that's where Marshall comes in. Mm-hmm. It's sort of the same thing. I want to build a line. You tell me how it works. You're my driver. Yeah. Go freaking get a lap record with this thing. Like, let's see. Just what don't roll is. it. Right. <laughs> well, <laughs> or whatever. Don't make a right when you should make a left. Go off the cliff. Don't roll it. Like, no. But it sounds like you solved a lot of the problems with it, and it's just it's just now just really making it overall um, just better, tweaking it. Like, the, the mechanics of the fill, the, the yes. skate. I want to say slate. The skate the um seamer like all that that is dialed in and works and now it's just making it better overall and making it easier and yes yeah yeah and making it um easier to manufacture if you will but just yeah a better uh kind of package Mm -hmm. and tweaking it that way but i sort of have an opinion on that too and like every year somebody comes out with new stuff and Mm -hmm. whatever and there's a new next thing and this and the that and whatever i don't really want this to there was no reason for this to change. Right. Right. It's sort of a, it's a, if this looks the same silhouette in 10 years or whatever, that's not a bad thing. No. And there's no. no reason it shouldn't. No. It's supposed to do one job, can, well, two jobs, not be frustrating, right. and can beer. 
Right. And if it can do that, then why do you need to reinvent? It's like a can opener. Or it works. Or the new cars that come out of here, you're like, why did you fix that? Now it's broken. It was working in the previous version. Why would you go through and, like we talked about earlier. Yeah. No, I mean, I take it to the extreme, but like, I think about like a lot of the useless, (laughs) useless gadgets or appliances that come out for cooking. And I'm like, was this really necessary? Because a knife would suffice. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, I just feel like there's certain things that, like, do we need, like, thousands of versions of something? And I just watched a... Does, my, does my frying pan need Bluetooth, really? I, right. I, I, I right. literally <laughs> still use the back of a knife to hammer a nail. Oh, it makes you so uncomfortable. I know, but I'm just like, I don't feel like I need to buy all this extra stuff. One good thing that serves multiple purposes is fine. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and I just watched a show about design on Sunday morning last weekend. Um, about this very thing and it made me feel really good about my whole ethos on engineering about keeping things simple yes. and making them task oriented and the problem is people want that bluetooth frying pan, or they think they do they think <laughs> like, they do you got a it's, frying pan or a bluetooth frying pan it's the I marketing the, it's right it's the marketing that right. sells them something they don't need and the, the and the, kudos to the salespeople that can sell you but as we all know, know sitting here saying it the bluetooth is the thing that's going to be the problem you like yep. it's yeah you no longer have a functioning frying pan because of this other thing. Right. And when you step back and look at it and go, that was so unnecessary. You know, what, what was the point of right. that? So that's sort of like, like right now, um, I'm always looking at scaling things down. Like what, what part do we not need? You know? Yes. To make it more efficient, to simplify it to, and, and like you did where you had um, like the, and, forgive me if I'm messing this up, like the lid holder versus the skate, which was like almost two separate things, or one was holding the can down, or the lid down on the can, and right. he combined it oh, sorry. Into, the, into the two. Like that's, that is a necessary, I'd call it an upgrade, because okay. you're simplifying the process and you're making it one less step, and it's, it's, it's a non-value added step when you have those two things. And so if you combine it into one, it's like that is a beautiful thing. Right, and I think Elon Musk, I may be misquoting him, so you know, like the most expensive part is the one you never needed. Yeah. You know, and that's sort of, you know, it's so true. Yes. It's like more is not good. Less is good. Less right? is more. Yeah. yeah. And um, another part of this canning line was I saw that those sensors on the other automated lines are what cause discrepancies in timing. Because that's what a sensor does. It senses and then assigns the timing, right. you know, value to it. So we have one sensor on this thing. And it's when the, the manifold drops. And that tells everything else to occur. That's it. Yeah. You know, everything else, your eyeballs are the best sensors you'll ever have. Um, You'll know if that's a good fill or not. And so then they have these other uh, expensive lines will have flow measuring devices. Mm -hmm. Well, those are not cheap and nor are they effective. So Uh, they have uh, it's a a failure point. Right. Yeah. It's a very expensive failure point. Yes. That when you're and again, you have to be realistic about what you're doing. Okay, the canning line that I build was meant for small operations that maybe want to do 10 or 20 cases to sell Mm in-house or maybe, you know, locally or whatever. Yeah. But we're not talking a regional operation. Distribution. Right. Yeah. So with that in mind, right, you are and you are super in control of the product that you're turning out, which is awesome. Right. Well, you're more than capable to watch these two cans get filled and determine whether it's a good fill. And then you're going to weigh the can, you know. Uh, you'll know and fairly quickly what a good fill looks like. Yeah. You're going to know whether a lid just went on that thing under the lid dispenser, you know, before you put it into the seamer, and you're going to run it into the seamer. So it's very well, hands-on in that It's a sense. very hands-on thing, but you're not running from the filler to the sink to the can line to the canner to the pallet to the, right. like, it's everything is, is much more compressed. And so is it is it hands-on with it? Absolutely. And at the brewery size, that's how it should be right. because... And what's going to happen is it's going to work every yes. time because you and your hands are what are moving it and determining it and, right. and so on. And that may sound like and it's trying to explain that to people or whatever, because that doesn't sound great. You look at these conveyors, you're like, oh, that's awesome, you know, and, and it is. I mean, it is to a certain level. But then when you start realizing the failure points and when that line goes down, when that conveyor belt goes down, right. your entire system dead in the water. Right. And you can't fold that system up and put it in Correct. the corner. And... When you talk to people, you know, like Marshall, mm-hmm. and you guys are like Pleasant, right? They're business owners that are brewers. Yes. They've got a lot to do in their day. They wear a lot of hats. Diagnosing a canning line is not part of it. Not a high That does list. not need to be a thing. Right. Right. That thing needs to do, like a hammer, it does its job. Yes. And then we put it away. Right. And we get on with the million other things that are going on. And usually some drama, probably, if there's a tap room <laughs> involved, right? Um, you know, there's a lot 
to deal like so like how many headaches do you want yeah you know i'm yeah. trying to make like you life know, easy one less headache. possible one less exactly. headache. and if you don't have to worry about your, your canning line you know or your fermenter or your all the other stuff that you have to do i mean that's just such it's a big deal and if you've never had to worry about it you don't know that it's something to worry about you don't know until you, you don't worry. know all right yeah so now we may go in something that's a little bit like when our customers grow mm-hmm. right do we have something that's more capable for them or right. whatever um you know we may do that but in a weird way i have opinions about that as well right. that i'm sort of selling out you know like mm-hmm. i fixate about canning like i told you okay so i want to be as authentic as possible right okay. and this product is a hundred percent and i want you to feel it know it whatever I feel like if I'm making other products, then I'm not as genuine. In and out. Got you. Yeah. yeah. No, and I don't know that's a lot of me. But this thing really does solve a lot of problems, and I'm incredibly proud of it. And I want it to, you know, I don't know if in my world mm-hmm. it's necessary to have a fleet of other products. Makes sense. You know? What you do and do it well. That's it. Keep it simple. Right. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. what I want. Like, And, again, less headaches. Right. You know, I don't, you know, I want to make something that's proven mm-hmm. that I can stand behind and sell and – you know, I really liked your mission statement where it's like cost effective, small footprint is a huge thing. Like, I just I feel like you had a mission. You, you should just you can and just you stick stay with true that. to you that. Stay true to, to the it. ethos. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, there wasn't anything really like that before. There still really isn't anything like it now. Yeah. yeah. So why do I need to go chase for something else? Well, you know, and, like, and your canner is in a lot of breweries. Yeah, in, we've been from super fortunate. in Arizona. I mean, new, but you guys are in other states too, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're um, twenty three breweries right 23. now. Twenty three. Yeah, we've got one coming out to uh, Galveston here. We're going to the Caribbean here before that. That's cool. Oh. That's fun. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do they have a lot of beer to can out there? Well, they're opening a brewery on this island uh, that's specific. Like, it's, it's a touristy destination. JB, this is all. It's got your name right all over <laughs> it. No, he likes it. He's our travel bug. So yes. Yeah. It's a deep sea diving operation, or well, uh, a touristy uh, uh-huh. scuba diving. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, or yeah. Um, so that's the main. There's a bunch of corals around there. That's the main touristy thing there. Mm-hmm. So all the beer on this little island is either it's Heineken, basically, I guess, and it's all brought in through a distributor. No it's red stripe. A, that's a shame. Well, okay, maybe there is. Okay, red stripe. <laughs> I'll, I'll find out. And let you know, all right? Uh, but yeah, they said, hey. There's no brewery here. Let's open a brewery. The guys own the dive shop. Well, there's a need. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, um, yeah, that's neat. So, oh, yeah, that's the other part of this, JB. It's a lot of fun. I mean, <laughs> I mean it's work, but, yeah, it's a lot of fun. At the, Yeah, I mean, at the very core of this, I am a consumer. Like, right. Maybe too much so, but I am a craft beer guy. Girl, I, this is me. I he, he's the brewer. I'm like, let me just drink all the beer. She we call her the professional taster because <laughs> we're trying to be respectful. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, how cool is like my job, right? I get to sell a piece of equipment and go to New beers, Hampshire, right? uh, Oklahoma, well, wherever. You're getting to travel. You're and you're getting behind the scenes in the breweries. You get to go to the areas that you know yes. not every Joe Schmo exactly. gets to go. You get the inside track. I mean, you were testing on Helton saying like your dump batches can I test on that okay cool great I mean that that is such an inside track one of the things that um, that's been kind of fun for us as we've been going is I've been a craft beer nerd for I don't know since like 2007 when I started brewing so I've been, I've been brewing for a while but I would always go to the breweries and be like hey can I come back and take a look at the tanks and like yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, no 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 which I understand like right. you're, you're whatever um now that we are are producing videos and we're talking to people and we're telling people stories and things like it's it's kind of opened a door for us, which has been a huge like dream of mine to be able to actually go back behind the scenes and like, can I just be a fly on the wall and watch you can beer yeah. or watch you brew or just this is where the magic happens. This is where we have an inside pass to do. And it's been such an amazing way to tell people stories and and to look at you're having the finished beer and it's delicious and it's wonderful and it's a social beverage. Everybody loves it. But do you realize, do you have any idea the number of people that it took to bring this to your glass? And not only in the brewery, but in the equipment and the canning and the distribution and that there's such this wide network of, of collaboration that has to happen sure. and in order to make that happen. And like JB was saying about the the rally car, and even the craft brew, where it's like it's a competitive industry. You're fighting for such a small piece of the pie. 
and you're you're all out trying to get more than your fair share, maybe, but you're still out there to help each other because it is a it's a social beverage. It's a it's a passion project, mm-hmm. and so I love hearing your story of of being like, yeah, I get to travel, I get to <laughs> solve problems, I get to be the, I get to work in my passion, yeah, and do what I love to do, and it's hard work sometimes, but it is so rewarding mm-hmm. and satisfying, yeah. to do what you do. Yeah, no, and I'm. Every day I count my blessings, you know, it's uh, I'm incredibly fortunate. I've met really great people. Um, you know, yeah, I put myself in the position also. There's some, you know, maneuvering. Yes. Uh, but there isn't a day I don't think, you know, my situation's just amazing. Yes. You know, I mean, what a great, you know, deal. You know, it's it's just so much fun. Yes. And, you know, I had that automotive tie in and so on. And I sort of equate it back to JB, what you're saying about making something else is sort of like I'm making handcrafted, basically hot rods for people, if you will, in the yeah, automotive yeah, sense. Yeah, definitely. Right? You want yeah. to go buy a car at Ford? Right. Go buy a car at Ford. Right. Right. You want a Shelby Cobra? Well, you need to go see Shelby. Right. And they'll build you a car. <laughs> right. Right. And they're going to put their you know, number on it and so on. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm getting an opportunity to build equipment for these companies Mm -hmm. and it makes me feel really cool i Mm -hmm. know it sounds kind of like a goober thing no i think it's it's, it's, not at all it like fires me up yes like it's my passion yes you know it's it's um yeah it's weird do you do you have a video uh to to explain how to use it and all that they do uh, on your website you've got a couple of really good videos that go through kind of the operation of of the machine itself yeah marshall's um on there yes. I think okay. there's probably like three or four um videos posted up gotcha. there yeah um typically so we'll do an install they'll they'll uh buy the line if they're local in arizona we'll deliver it and right. I'll, i cover the training and whatever and we do that if they're out of state of course there's cost you know right. the caribbean right and it's sort of like well i'm sorry those are costs that yeah you well, yeah, yeah, course, yeah, everything. No, right. yeah yeah business yeah so, uh, but then uh, we will roll in, and I always go. I, I cover my own costs because again, it's you know work, and someone's got to do it. Right. And, uh, <laughs> someone's got to go to the crew. right. <laughs> and I don't I like to meet all my clients, you know, right. you oh, know sure. personally. Yeah. yeah. And know yes. who. And then Marshall will do the training, but typically it'll take you know a half hour right. of running it for someone to get kind of familiar. You guys went and saw yeah. it. Yeah. Yes. So you get the idea. They got it dialed in really quick. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, you know, yeah, it's not so much, you know, um, it's just you've never seen anything like it before. No. Right. right? No. So you kind of need someone there to go, okay, well, here's the button to turn it on, you mm-hmm. know, right. and kind of walk you through it. And so it's not like this mind blowingly weird thing or whatever, but yes. still, it's necessary. When it's turned on, it looks like mission control for me. Right. I mean, <laughs> yeah, and we want to make sure our clients have the best experience right, right. out of the box. And so training is, is definitely part of that. Yes. And here's another reality that I got to see firsthand in the world of brewing, right? You got your master brewers, you know, maybe, uh, uh, you know, the owner of the company or whatever that's really invested in the canning line or, like, interested in it whenever, whenever it shows up. And I mean, like, a high-end piece of equipment, whatever, right? Yeah. My experience leading up to this point. Okay, well, very quickly, they realize they've got a, they've got a business to run, mm-hmm. right? So, ultimately, that job gets handed off to the sellerman yes. or whatever, right. okay? Yeah. Which, again, not to be disparaging, but they're like the rookie, the newbie in the operation. They're cleaning kegs, right. and they're doing all the kind of the grunt work, yes. and they're running the canning line. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So we thought about that, or I did. I'm not designing this line for the smartest person in the brewery, the right. most capable, <laughs> right? Hey, it's You're designing it for the most inexperienced, working their That's way it. up, doing right. grunt work. That's like, it. Yes. The and guy that got hired yesterday. Make, that's how you make that thing successful. Yes. Because if it's overly complicated and can't be run, but except by anybody who has like a doctorate, <laughs> th- that doesn't work. Right. It has to be. So I'm not making it for the owner. I'm making it for the kid you hired yesterday or to operate. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And if you can do that, well, then you're probably going to be okay. Yeah. 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 So that's amazing. Mm-hmm. That's so cool. Thank you so much. Of course. For coming down and know. spending some time you. with us and. We don't want to take up too much of your time today. So um, the beers were delicious. The cigars were actually really good. This was great. We had better ventilation today. I think we had some <laughs> ventilation issues last time with Eric. It got real smoky in here. And he wasn't partaking in the cigars. No. So I felt, <laughs> I felt so bad about it. I'm like, it's getting a little hazy in here. Yeah, he's so. a trooper. Oh, he is. Oh, yeah. he's, a, he's a cool dude. He yes, was he really is. cool. Yeah. Yes. So we had so much fun talking to him and, and Marshall. And, and we appreciate you coming by and doing it. I would love, if you're okay with it, 
we got some great footage of uh, the Cano in action, yeah. and we want to piece together something, and we're going to overlay some of that footage on top of today's episode. Cool. So people, so the 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 viewers and, and the listeners can see if they're not just listening, uh, kind of what we're talking about as we talk through it. But I would love to do more of an in depth. Um, just kind of a one-on-one -on -one and like really dig into the machine itself because yeah. I think it's so fascinating. And again, mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, yeah, well. I'm a mechanical geek. I just, I don't necessarily understand it, but I love the intricacies and the planning that goes into it. And like, I try to build all of my own stuff. Yeah. He, he built the, uh, the Bruce stand that we use. I nice. built that and designed that hundred percent well to the frame, Very designed cool. the electrical panel. Yeah. Like everything is, it's, he built a grain mill. I built the grain mill. It's a, it's a, um, well, I didn't do the grain mill because I'm not that great metal work, but the, the cabinet box. that it sits in actually folds up to compress down so I can slide it. So it's, it's a smaller footprint and then it completely unfolds and you can crush in it. So it's, I, I like everything you're saying. I'm like, Oh my God, mm -hmm. I would love to spend well, the day. Let me, just... let me tell you about like the key to not being great at something is to hire people that are. Mm -hmm. And so while I built the first one on that lathe that I went, whatever, I quickly went, Okay, now I'll find the guy that does it for a living. Yes, right. and hire them. That's the welder I'm going to go see here right at when we're done. And a couple, I've got a bunch of really incredible, talented people. A uh, guy that designed my software, the yeah. firm that designed the seamer. You want to talk about genius? Some experts. Oh my gosh, some subject matter experts. Whoa, yeah, yeah. like next level. They do deep sea robotics. Oh, <laughs> gee, that's no joke. Throw that out there. The deep sea uh, robotics. Is that for the can seamer? The deep, or is that the software? The ones that both. Both. And they do their own printed circuit boards, and they do machining. I mean, it's... I wonder if they ever felt or realized when they were doing the deep sea stuff, they're like, yeah, we'll be doing some canning here at some point. Yeah, no. saw software no, no. for a canning machine. Like, yeah, that was, was amazing. The space age stuff. Those guys was... Uh, I said, I need a seamer, a yeah. can seamer. And they're like, yeah, all right, what the hell is that? Yeah. Like, well, you know, I kind of give you an idea, but... And they, boom, right out the box. And it's been the most amazing thing ever. Like the Not shit. Not even the same industry. No, no idea. He doesn't even drink. That's there. Well, it drives me crazy because they, they're out of Houston. Uh huh. Uh, they've got a brewery a block away from his house. He never goes. He walks by it every day because he goes on a walk. Mm. Okay. And yeah, I said when I went and visit, I said you didn't tell me it was a block from your house, and they're the perfect brewery for me. I'm like, why haven't you? We went there, and they, unfortunately, the owner wasn't there. I'm like, why don't you go sell a line there or right? whatever? Yeah. yeah. It's like, I don't know. I'm just not comfortable. You know, I, I don't drink. I don't know. I don't know right. any of that. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> but but you want to talk deep sea robotics. So they they, know. they're out of Houston. So, yeah, all the oil rigs and all that stuff. They, that's a thing, that's man. The, yeah, for sure. So, uh, yeah, crazy people. You, you know, kind that's of guys. It's quite the journey. It's a trip. Yeah. Yeah. That it, is very cool. It is very cool. The world's a wonderful place. Yes. It is. With all this great craft beer to drink. Yes. Mm. And bourbon. And, oh, and cigars and whiskey and cigars like I, man i'm not upset no this is not bad for a sunday morning <laughs> <laughs> i wish you hadn't given the time earlier i would have said like yeah we're just finishing now it's uh nine o'clock right oh it makes it yeah. even better that we're just doing this at 11 in the morning <laughs> now this is something we enjoy and, and we have so much yeah. fun with it and again we appreciate you coming out and having some stogies with us and of course having some beers with us and yeah. i just i love the story and i, I want to do some more work with you and i want to keep well, thank talking you. about thank that you. because yeah. it's just i'm fascinated by what you do and yeah. I, I think we kind of all are and we appreciate mm -hmm. the entrepreneurial spirit taking that chance and leveraging the experience that you have from the past and being able to turn that into something that is so within your wheelhouse and within your passions I yeah. mean, that's just that's awesome well, I appreciate it. I mean, I think it's a really fun story with a lot of great people, mm -hmm. you know, but I certainly try to not come off as some knowing, all knowing, you know, whatever, listen to me, kind of. So I'm a little bit awkward about whatever. I don't think so, know. no. And I that think, was pretty cool. Man. I think having the frame of mind of you're always learning, and that's the same with brewing. Like, I don't care how long you've been brewing, you're always learning something. It's always adapting. It's always changing. It's it's always and if you have the frame of mind of, like, I know everything, you can't learn and you can't oh, adapt, you can't doubt. change. Without you need doubt. to approach it with a, yeah, I know a lot, but I don't know everything. Oh, and there's no doubt of that. But I'll, everything could be tweaked a little bit, and there's nothing wrong with that. Yes. And prepare to fail. Yes. There's absolutely, I mean, that's the most important thing, I think, that I learned in this whole journey is, man, failure. Like, you just got to. That's not a bad it's thing. It's okay. No, it's a it good thing. It is not thing. a bad thing. No, it's. Because it makes it better if you can stick with it, get through the failure, and learn from it, and keep yep. going. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. It's great. 
So. Well, go to your local craft brewery and pick up a four pack. Yes, mm. support canning. Support canning. You're supporting local brewery <laughs> and the canner. Mm. Well, <laughs> again, as a consumer, there's a side of that too. I used to hate getting growlers, growlers, and the bartender doing a growler. You know, they didn't like it either, right? It was kind of a, a thing. Well, now you can go grab a four pack. Yeah. Drink it whenever you want or right. not. Throw it in your fridge. It's easy for the bartender. Yes. Right? They just kind of ring it up. Well, they do did crowlers for a while, which that is was really hard, though, big can. Then you'd have they to didn't... almost drink the whole thing because yes. you can't like. It's a commitment. Yeah, it was a, a whole. It was a whole commitment. It was yeah. a whole commitment. <laughs> yeah. so you better have a buddy with you, and as soon as you <laughs> open it, it's game on. Yes. Yep. You know, but even if you don't open it, it's got a, a diminished life because you know. you're not doing it in an oxygen free. Correct. You're not purging it. You're not capping on foam. It's, Correct. You, you got 48 hours. Really, once you crack it, you got like 12 or 24. Well, yeah. we've all seen that bartender fill a growl and just foam uh, coming out, oh, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and them not being happy about it. You being that guy that orders, the, you know, growler or crowler or whatever. Yes. So, yeah, being able to go grab a four-pack at your local brewery, and like you said, and go home, um, you know, because you, you're on your way home from exactly. work. Exactly. Like, it's just sometimes you don't want to be social and you don't want to have to be at a bar to have good beer. You just or, wanna... you know, you got to drive home, so sitting at the bar That's drinking a, a beer is yeah. not an option. Exactly. Right. Right. Enjoy yeah. it at home. Yeah. Get it yeah. fresh and bring it home. Fresh is the big thing. But that's the best. I love going to, say, Ren House and just swinging by and grabbing a four-pack oh, on the I way home. Ren House. And, yes. Yep. Yeah. They got some good beers. I wish I could stay, but again, I'm driving home from work, so I just pop in, get a four-pack. and Yeah. You know. And, You're uh, supporting it, but you don't yeah. have to necessarily. And they don't even own one of my canning lines. They, yeah, they, they don't. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Wow, they should probably call you up. <laughs> they're, are they opening up in PV, right. though, soon? Yeah, or next year, I think. Well, they've got their uh, production up in Prescott. Yeah, they're they're a little bit Bigger. larger scale than is my okay. Uh, okay. my usual. Like, I'll write a letter. I don't care. I'll yeah. go down there. Well, we all like, should. Oh, they should have one anyway, yes. right? Correct. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Especially in that little ha- birdhouse that they have. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Red house. That little shack that they have, the original. Like, it's so tiny. Like, you know, I would never go there for a beer because it's just so tiny. Like, yes. I don't know. Watching uh, the mobile canners show up there because they had the production <laughs> facility out back, and they had it on the sidewalk yeah. running into the brewery. <laughs> I was like, wow, my hats off to you guys, the Mobile West guys. You know, I was like, man, for figuring out how to make this work? Make it work. <laughs> and of course, some of the stories that Marshall tells, you know, about literally canning in parking lots and stuff like that. You know, he didn't, you know? In, he didn't enlighten us in a lot of those uh, uh, stories, and I don't know if it was because he was too traumatized or... He, he didn't. He didn't divulge a lot. He just said, "Yes, can mobile canning line. It's well, definitely necessary in some instances." But I'll, yeah, I'll give you a, a, a real quick, whatever example of stories I've heard. Okay, so the packaging side of it, and people often don't consider this, is it's a pallet of cans. Yes. Okay. Well, you got to have room for that. That's another thing you need to have room for. So it's a square foot. You have my small canning line. Great. You yeah. know, you still have got a pallet of something that needs to be stored somewhere. Yes. And on the big scale of that, Four Peaks, um, my neighbor down there. Uh, uh, I'm fortunate enough, my neighbor mm-hmm. manages the Four Peaks. Oh. Yeah, so that was kind of a nice coincidence as well. So we get access to their labs and uh, all their good stuff. They have an entire new warehouse for all of their packaging material. Okay. Oh, wow. To just hold just their the cans, because right? it's got to go somewhere. Just right. They have an enormous warehouse. So they're doing a lot of their production still? Uh, yes. I didn't know that. Y- yeah, it, and it, uh, like I get it. It's probably split up. It is. It's that's a, a weird. Lot. That's it's, a lot. It's a it's an odd thing, and I don't want to speak too much about Fair. it. But gotcha. yeah, but yes, because the uh, uh, AB connection. Yeah. Okay. They look at what's more economical, and you know of they're course, looking yeah. at it that way. Um, so, but they, you know, there are good sides to that. They have an entire lab there that right. I get access to, which is tremendous, and it's that's a cool. cheap thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyway, so yeah, their packaging materials goes in an entire facility. Well, I've heard stories from Marshall about how some places had their cans outside. Oh, that's yes, bad. Because it, that's yeah, bad practice. Yeah, you got rainwater, <laughs> uh, uh, all sorts of funky uh, things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, Yikes. Yeah. 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 So. I don't know if he... Uh, Marshall had a friend that also used to work at Hilton, and I don't know if you actually knew him or not, but Aaron, like, he was on... Like, he was the one that was, like, kind of jumping in our... Anyway, so I think we talked about that... Oh, yes, Aaron, yes. That what we talked about was... Back in the day, like that was kind of our mecca of craft beer, though. Like, if you think about it, it was Helton, and then it was like Ren House. Like, that whole area was like the Sandy. Bermuda Triangle. Yes. <laughs> and then yes. Uh, Wandering Oso, Tortoise is kind of over. Wandering, Oso. Yeah, Oso, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Arcadia, like, our, they had, um, they still have the attic, which wasn't 
homebrew craft brew but like just a good beer selection it was the beer bar right like good food beer bar so i don't know that reminds me of like my disneyland of beer <laughs> yeah yeah and then they've got the new trevors down there <gasps> yeah oh which uh dave portnoy did the pizza review yes. and yeah uh, you can't get in no yeah right. i heard they had to shut it down yeah well, yeah no that was i think that was the one that's more up north well i think trevors was fine it was the Ag- other one Sorry. the one that's agniamo the one over by scott's own shay i think that one they had to shut down but Trevor's oh, because he brought so much business that they didn't have the staffing. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah, because I have the original one by me on Scottsdale McDowell, and they don't, you know, they have food trucks. But that place is a mecca. Yeah. 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 So, but, yeah. Yeah, it's a great area. I'm fortunate enough to live in that great little area, yes. too. There's a lot going on. And yeah. Yeah. Another happy coincidence. Hey, guys, thank you so much for tuning into the Hot Break Craft Beer Cast. A special thanks to Andrew for stopping by and and spending it's some Anthony. time with us. Oh, my God. Did you messing say Anthony you. again? I thought I said Andrew. You did. You did. Oh, my God. Awesome. Now you're messing with me. <laughs> That's awesome. That was the best. Oh, my God. <laughs> Brain space. My God. <laughs> Plot twist. Oh. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> he's, our, he's our kind of people. Like, I like This it. is great. It's I love awesome. it. All right. Special thanks to our mystery guests that joined us today. <laughs> it begins with an A. Who's messing with me? Emphasis on the A. Yeah, uh, no, we appreciate a lot of names. Appreciate <laughs> an A. Appreciate Andrew stopping by and joining us today. We had some great stuff. We we'll definitely got to circle back and do this again. Love you on the podcast. Absolutely. Love to do some more follow-up videos with you and stuff. We really appreciate it. Cheers, my friend. Cheers. We appreciate it so much. Absolutely. Yay. Thanks to all of you. All right. Catch you later, my friends. <laughs>